Um, yes. Right. Perfect. <laughs> I so, love uh, that. Great so title. This is a, so this is going to be a brutal introduction to Kubernetes. Everybody does a gentle introduction to everything. This one will be a brutal <laughs> one. So we'll go uh, in a short time through uh, tons of stuff. Uh, pretty much a, a big subset of the book, if you saw this uh, thick book that uh, Subut I mentioned. So this is what we're going to do today. And then I will have uh, questions in the end. So uh, this is uh, the agenda. Who is this guy? So I'll introduce myself and then uh, what's Kubernetes? Uh, who needs Kubernetes? A little bit of Kubernetes uh, architecture, pods and containers, uh, Kubernetes networking, Kubernetes storage, Kubernetes security and access control, the API request lifecycle, deploying applications, Kubernetes is an extensible platform. And then uh, in the end, uh, what you really care about is uh, Kubernetes and the uh, machine learning. So uh, let's uh, keep moving. So uh, yeah, like we discussed already, I am a Numenta alumnus. Uh, was it Numenta 2006 to 2011? And then I'm in general a serial uh, startup engineer. So I'm uh, almost always uh, working for uh, startups. I worked maybe for a couple of big companies. So. Uh, 12 companies so far and counting. So this is over like, uh, when did I start? Uh, 95, so uh, yeah, almost uh, 30 years of uh, startups. And I always try to do uh, something new. So uh, obviously at Numenta, I did the brain inspired AI and then I did some uh, virtual reality and uh, IoT, air quality sensors, uh, genomics, uh, distributed uh, game engines and uh, always uh, something uh, new and exciting and uh, and then uh, at uh, one of the startups uh, that i worked for uh, called the aclima this is the one with the iot and air quality sensors uh, we started to use uh, docker containers and uh, we ran into the problem of uh, how to, do you manage a lot of uh, containerized uh, applications so we start, started to evaluate uh, the, the options there kubernetes was at uh, 0 0.9 this point so I chose uh, Kubernetes over uh, Mesos that was kind of the incumbent uh, and I didn't uh, regret this choice. And then uh, accidentally I, I wrote a bunch of books on it. So uh, the way I learn uh, new things is uh, I typically play with them a little bit and then uh, write some uh, technical uh, article about them. So uh, I wrote this article and then uh, suddenly a packet this, uh, the publishing company, they approached me and told me, uh, so uh, we have this uh, guy writing a book on Kubernetes, but his schedule changed and uh, he can't continue. We saw your uh, article on Kubernetes. Uh, maybe you want to, uh, to uh, just uh, write the book. So I said, uh, sure, why not? And then at this point, I really had uh, almost uh, no knowledge of Kubernetes. So I pretty much uh, you know, play with it for a couple of weeks, evaluated, wrote an article, and uh, that's about it. So uh, I was uh, following uh, the, the table of contents and then uh, just... Uh, pretty much uh, learning uh, as I'm writing the book. So there's this chapter, okay, there is this uh, chapter on security. Okay, let's uh, let's read about it. Let's play with it a little bit. Let's try those things. And then, uh, so that was the first edition. Now uh, the first edition is out. So uh, now I know a little bit more about Kubernetes. So we can uh, get into that today. And then I also I'm a Jiu-Jitsu uh, brown belt. So this is, uh, if you care about what they do uh, outside of uh, programming and Kubernetes and tech. All right, so uh, let's move on. So uh, what's, uh, what's Kubernetes really? So in one sentence, Kubernetes uh, is an orchestration platform for running uh, containerized workloads in uh, almost any environment. You can run it uh, locally on your laptop. You can run it uh, on-prem if, uh, if you have your own uh, server farm or uh, you can run it in the cloud and you can also run it uh, as a hybrid mode. So running in different environments, multiple clusters that are uh, connected together and uh, communicating. So this is a very common uh, advanced uh, use case. And then uh, Kubernetes is uh, highly flexible. It's an extensible platform that can scale to the needs of uh, any organizations, uh, pretty much like a planet scale uh, systems uh, run on Kubernetes in production in these days. And it is also a, an extremely uh, well-maintained uh, open source project. It has a huge community and the ecosystem around it. So I'm not going to go into the history too much because uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you want to follow up how it uh, came to be in general. So originally coming from Google, but uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. And, but by the way, feel free to uh, stop me for questions uh, 
along the way because uh, it's going to be very dense. So if I'm saying uh, something completely incomprehensible, then uh, yeah, well, we can uh, spend the time to uh, go over it. So that's a uh, Kubernetes in uh, one sentence. So then uh, who really needs uh, Kubernetes? Why, why, why do you need Kubernetes? So uh, you need Kubernetes if you run uh, tens to uh, millions of servers and then uh, you drink the containerization Kool-Aid. If uh, you're running your uh, workloads in containers then and you have uh, more than a couple of servers, probably you need the Kubernetes. You need a way to uh, orchestrate all those uh, containers. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so when you have uh, more than a few uh, servers, it's uh, very challenging to manage your infrastructure efficiently and uh, securely. So this is where Kubernetes comes in. Uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, point. Uh, why tens? Why not like if you have four servers, why, why wouldn't you use Kubernetes? Well, sorry, why not uh, choose what? Uh, you know, you said uh, you need it if you're running tens to millions of servers. Uh, and I'm curious what the lower bound is, in your opinion. Uh, what if you have like four servers, you know, and you're sharing four servers? Is that too way too small for Kubernetes? Or uh, if you have no prior Kubernetes knowledge, I would say this is uh, too small because uh, Kubernetes can uh, can help already at the at the four servers level. But there is a lot of complexity with uh, running Kubernetes managing it. So uh, if uh, you have no knowledge of Kubernetes, uh, probably this is uh, too early. It's best, best to use a kind of a more ad hoc approaches, just uh, kind of the traditional ways or use uh, cloud providers uh, systems. Uh, so if it's AWS, you can run an ECS with containers, et cetera. There's no need for Kubernetes at this level. I would say uh, when you get to uh, 20, 30 uh, servers, then this is uh, probably what you want, you want to really want Kubernetes. What if we have a server that has in our case, eight GPUs, and then we have multiple servers, but we want to manage at the GPU level, not at the machine level, if that makes sense. Is that? So, uh, yeah, yes, so, so the, way, uh, the, the way it works with uh, Kubernetes, the basic uh, kind of a hardware unit, it's called a node, which is a server or a VM. Uh, and okay. uh, it's, uh, but you have a lot of control about uh, how you uh, allocate different uh, workloads to, uh, to different nodes. But uh, within the same, uh, so you have a server with uh, eight uh, GPUs, you, you have a lot of control about specific uh, applications that, that they have a kind of uh, requests that, that they request a certain amount of uh, GPU, for example, right? So it could be uh, all kinds of units from a uh, zero point something to a uh, complete, typically with GPU, you want the whole GPU. But uh, in general, uh, the way it manages uh, allocation is that uh, it can uh, kind of a budget uh, for specific uh, applications, specific workloads to use uh, just part of the of the resources on each uh, on each node. So it has a lot okay. of uh, sophisticated mechanism to uh, select and choose and uh, allocate. Things. Okay, okay, great, yeah. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the architecture of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, uh, first of all, Kubernetes runs in uh, clusters. So this is a kind of the, the overall uh, way to manage uh, to, to manage your uh, infrastructure with Kubernetes. And uh, the, typically with a really large scale uh, systems, you have uh, multiple clusters. So uh, one cluster can accommodate uh, not normally between uh, up to uh, 1000 uh, nodes. And the, the nodes themselves can be very big, right? You can have uh, 64 cores, uh, 128 cores, but uh, Kubernetes itself uh, manages about uh, 1,000 nodes, but uh, the, there are all kinds of uh, high performance uh, clusters uh, with special accommodation that can run even at 5,000 nodes. But again, if we're talking about uh, really massive, uh, large companies, then uh, even that's not enough, right? So then maybe they need the uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of, uh, of nodes. So they work with multiple clusters. And then each cluster has a control plane and the data plane. The control plane uh, has uh, multiple components. It's got an API server. So Kubernetes is, uh, you can think about it as uh, exposing a REST API. And then there is a state store. It keeps the state. It's using something called the etcd, which is a key value store. And then there is a controller manager. So this is a, one of the kind of a special source, secret source of Kubernetes, not so secret, but uh, what really makes it special is that you have those uh, 
multiple control loops that they are keep uh, keep running. They're watching etcd. They're watching the persistent store for changes, and then they reconciliate the state of the system to the state of the of uh, etcd. So uh, the developers, let's say, they deploy uh, an uh, application, so that makes it change uh, that uh, changes etcd, and then the controller that's responsible for deployments look at etcd and says, okay, there is something new. I need to uh, make the necessary changes to make this application run, get uh, all the resources it needs and uh, make it uh, cooperate with uh, the rest of the workloads and, and the applications in the system. And then there is a scheduler. Scheduler is uh, the thing that assigns uh, pods to nodes. So again, pods, we'll talk about pods in a second, but pretty much this is the basic uh, deployment units of uh, in Kubernetes. So uh, applications are uh, packaged in pods and those pods get assigned to nodes, which are the, the servers, the, the VMs, the instances, and that's uh, how they get uh, to decide where to run. And then there is a cloud controller manager. So when a Kubernetes runs in the cloud, it interfaces with the cloud provider to actually get all the resources it needs, uh, computer resources, instances, uh, networking, and storage. So this is the job of the Cloud Controller Manager. And then uh, th there is the data plane. The data plane are the actual nodes that they run the workloads. And on each one of these nodes, Kubernetes has uh, some special components. So there is uh, something called the kubelet, which is an agent that uh, talks to the Kubernetes API server. This is how Kubernetes knows about the, the state of each node, if it's healthy or not, and uh, what's, uh, what's going on there as far as uh, CPU load, memory load, etc. Then there is the container runtime. So again, Kubernetes is uh, all about running containers. So on each node, we need the container runtime. So it could be Docker, but uh, now more commonly, people use a uh, container and container D. All the, all the cloud providers uh, use a uh, container D as uh, the container runtime. So this is the thing that knows how to uh, run containers. And then there is a kube proxy, which is a uh, a networking uh, component and it manages firewall, firewall rules between uh, different nodes and it allows them to uh, talk to each other and uh, discover each other. So this is the data plane and we can see it here uh, in the picture, right? So this is the, this is the cluster, overall cluster. And we have here the, this is the control plane. So we have a etcd, right? The data store state, we have the scheduler that's running, the API server and controller manager and cloud controller manager talking to a uh, cloud APIs. Uh, on the right, we see one uh, worker node. So it has those uh, three components that I mentioned, the kube proxy, the kubelet, and the container runtime. And the API server communicates uh, with them, not with the container runtime. Container runtime, it's only the kubelet uh, is talking to the container runtime. And then here on the left, we see uh, how, do, how do you interact with the Kubernetes cluster, right? So you always go to the to the API server, you're talking to the API server. And Kubernetes has a very good uh, command line interface uh, called the cube cuttle. And uh, you just uh, run a command uh, commands against the API server. And then CI CD systems, uh, this is the typically uh, how you want to do, you run your system uh, often uh, using uh, GitOps, etc. So you make changes uh, to your system and uh, the CI CD uh, applies them to the Kubernetes uh, to the API server, and then those get reflected and go through the whole loop. And then also where uh, there are SDKs. So you can also uh, write uh, code that uh, talks to, uh, to client libraries, to SDKs, to the API server, and uh, watching from the outside and uh, making changes or uh, just deciding how to control it, how to allocate more things. So this is the architecture. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the nodes, pods, and the containers. So those are the things that uh, actually uh, run in our cluster. So each, uh, each worker node may contain uh, multiple pods. Pods, again, this is the unit of uh, deployment. And uh, that's what I just said here, second bullet. And each pod can contain uh, one or more containers. So uh, typically it's uh, one container, but uh, Often uh, you may want to have uh, another container or a couple of containers even that uh, do different things. Uh, so uh, it's a pattern that's called the sidecar, sidecar container. So for example, for uh, networking purposes, there's something called the service mesh that uh, every uh, communication that goes to, uh, to, the, to the main container 
that uh, does the work, it's uh, intercepted by this uh, sidecar container that can apply all kinds of uh, policies and rules and uh, decide uh, if the request is valid or not. So this is a, <clears throat> an example of a sidecar container. And then the containers are the ones that actually uh, do the work. So this is pretty much a processor that are packaged uh, with a specific uh, image and uh, they, just, uh, they just run and then they have a, Kubernetes controls a lot of the things that you can configure on uh, containers as far as uh, networking and the uh, volumes and the uh, security capabilities, et cetera. So Kubernetes gives you a way to uh, control and manage all that. And then uh, containers in the, in the same pod, they can communicate with each other using a uh, local host. So uh, they kind of, uh, they know that uh, they, they can assume that they are together on the same node and communicate with each other if they need to. Containers of uh, different pods on the same node can, uh, if they know that they're on the same node, right? They can uh, make sure that the uh, different uh, pods ends up on the same on the same node with through different uh, labels and other mechanisms. So pods, uh, containers in pods, different pods on the same node can communicate with each, with each other through a uh, ephemeral empty uh, deal volume. So pretty much uh, a local uh, a local disk on the node, and then they can just. Uh, Talk to each other. They can also uh, communicate uh, through uh, just uh, their IP address if they know it. But uh, this is kind of a uh, more uh, direct if they want kind of to share uh, share state. So that's uh, and this is what it looks like, right? So we have uh, nodes here. Here, node one. We have uh, two pods here. And this example, uh, this uh, diagram. Uh, all the pods have uh, two containers, but typically it will be uh, one container and then sometimes uh, more. Okay, any questions? Uh, it's all uh, crystal clear so far? It, it is, uh, but I'm trying. I'm struggling with the granularity at which you wanted to define your problem mapping on this architecture. So hypothetically, suppose you wanted to take a transformer and shard it. Is that, you know, at too fine a grain level for uh, Kubernetes or uh, how, how would you kind of map that? So uh, it, it, it's really uh, up to you, right? So uh, if you think about it, uh, a container is a, is a process. So uh, if you want to uh, shard your uh, transformer between uh, multiple processes, then uh, you can put it in uh, different uh, containers. If uh, you want uh, within the same process, use uh, multiple, uh, multiple threads or any, any other mechanism, then uh, you can do the two. So this is Kubernetes is agnostic to a, uh, how you shard your uh, your application, or your service, or your system? It's uh, it, it's operating at the lower level than that. Okay, so so conceptually, I understand that. I guess my question is: uh, Is there a minimum practical unit size such that the overhead of going through the Kubernetes protocol uh, dominates the cost over you know the you know the amount of work functional work you get out of something? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is often uh, something that uh, you do with uh, monitoring. So uh, you want to uh, to see that uh, you, you measure uh, how much a specific workload is uh, using, how much uh, CPU, how much memory, uh, how much disk, how much uh, networking bandwidth. So you uh, keep track of that. And then uh, you want to uh, allocate to uh, each uh, pod the... Uh, uh, the resources it needs. Uh, obviously, there are some uh, volatilities, so where uh, you want to, uh, to, to you want to make sure. So there are the mechanisms that are kind of uh, flexible. So there are things that are called the request, which is something that's uh, guaranteed. You always have those uh, resources. But then there is something called limits. So limits uh, for memory, you can't exceed those limits. If uh, you try to allocate more this that, that much uh, memory, then uh, Kubernetes will just uh, kill you, or actually the container runtime. Uh, Will kill you and then everything will uh, restart and you have to uh, be able to uh, handle it but if in case of a cpu if you exceed the limits then uh, you're not going to uh, kubernetes is not going to, to kill you but uh, you're going to get uh, throttle so the, those is uh, this is a uh, part of the things of uh, how to work with kubernetes how to uh, fine-tune those things uh, how to keep track of, over them uh, over time and then uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of work with uh, also making sure that you don't uh, give too many resources to workloads that they don't need it because then yeah, you waste resources. So cost is, uh, when you operate at scale, cost is a big issue. 
So this is kind of the game that you always play, uh, fine tuning and uh, configuring and keeping track. And uh, when you get to a more sophisticated level, you can do those things uh, automatically. So it's not that an engineer uh, has to look at uh, all kinds of uh, graphs and metrics and uh, figure out uh, in the morning that uh, actually uh, last night uh, we uh, ran only at a 5% uh, <clears throat> utilization and uh, we wasted a lot of money, but uh, you have things that uh, operate and uh, we'll talk a little bit about it uh, later. Okay, so so just to summarize, so initially it might be coming upon you to uh, monitor, keep track of your working set size, but at a layer level sophistication that could be automated. Uh, yeah, yes, it, it, it can be uh, always uh, adjusted, yes. And, and, okay. and so those limits are per node or per cluster? Like I say, I the, need... The, the limits uh, are per uh, container. So uh, within the pod, within a pod, a single pod, you have uh, multiple containers. Each con For each container within the pod, you can define its own uh, requests and limits. So a uh, request is guaranteed. Let's say I say uh, I request uh, one CPU, okay? And then I'm allocated on a node that uh, has a... Uh, Eight, uh, eight cores, and I, I uh, request one core. So one core is guaranteed. I, I'll always have uh, one core. That's uh, Even if I don't use it, I'll, I'll have it. But then uh, let's say uh, sometimes I burst and I need uh, two cores. So if there is, a, as, as long as there, there is an available uh, core, there is an available uh, capacity on this node that I'm currently scheduled to, then uh, I'll be able to use more than uh, one core. But uh, if, if I exceed the, but, but if the, the limit is uh, two cores and I exceed the two cores, now I need the uh, three cores, then uh, I may get uh, throttled. Again, if no other, uh, if, if, if no one else, uh, if there is a lot of uh, free capacity on this node, then uh, I can get even more than the limit. But uh, if, uh, if there are other, uh, other pods that are running and uh, we compete for resources, then uh, once uh, I exceed the, the, the limit, then uh, I get uh, I get throttled. Right, but the pod cannot exceed the limit of the node, right? No, not yet. You can't exceed it yet. That you're running on a node, uh, you, you, you can't use more than, uh, than available. So if, I, if the node has eight, eight CPUs and I need 12, I cannot divide the pod between two nodes. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually Kubernetes takes care of it. So let, let's say uh, if you, uh, request, uh, you request uh, 12 cores, 12 CPUs, and the node has only eight, then uh, the scheduling will, and you specified, I want to be scheduled specifically to this node, right? So there are labels, there are different ways to identify nodes. If, uh, ideally you don't even do that, right? So you let Kubernetes choose the right. You just say, I want uh, 12, uh, I request uh, 12 CPUs. And then there could be the different uh, nodes, different node pools with different uh, machine, uh, machine types, different instances. So Kubernetes will pick the correct one for you. But let's say that there is no, uh, no, yeah, all the instances are just eight cores in this cluster, and you uh, specify the 12 cores, then uh, your uh, your deployment will fail, and then it will, uh, the pod will be in a state that's called the uh, pending. So uh, the, the pods have a kind of, there is a life cycle of uh, how they get into the cluster. So then since uh, there is no way to schedule this pod to any, any node, then it will be in a pending state, and then you can uh, view it and the, uh, this is part of the troubleshooting, right? So something like that happens, then uh, someone that uh, has some uh, understanding uh, needs to look and see, okay, the, the pod is pending, why? So there are uh, all kind of uh, log messages, etc. So you can see that you'll get an error message that says uh, there is no, uh, it, it's actually in the pod itself. So there is a status to each pod. And then in the pod itself, you can see it says uh, unable to schedule this pod, no, uh, no node available with uh, that much uh, CPU. Right, so my Kubernetes will not break the pod so it fits into multiple nodes. Yeah, the, the pod it will just not run, right? So you're trying to deploy this pod, you try to run yeah. something, then uh, you are unable to, so your deployment oh. fails. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes networking. It is uh, pretty sophisticated because it really needs to cater to uh, any, uh, any scenario almost. So the, the basic uh, premise is that uh, there is a flat address space at the pod level. Each pod in the cluster has uh, its own uh, unique IP address. Okay? So it's not every container, it's uh, every, uh, every pod. And then we have uh, three types of communication inside the, the cluster. So that's kind of what's called the east-west traffic, but not talking to the outside yet. 
So we can uh, have the intrapod communication, container to container. So in this case, like we mentioned, they can just use local host because uh, the entire pod of those containers, uh, it has the same IP address. And then uh, the interpod communication, right? So pod to pod, so they can talk to each other through uh, their unique uh, IP address. And then there is a pod to service communication. So service is another abstraction. It's kind of an uh, internal uh, load balancer for pods. If you have a workload with uh, multiple uh, replicas, multiple instances, right? you have uh, three uh, containers that uh, do the work and then uh, you want to uh, talk to uh, one of them, you don't care uh, which one, then you can put a service, a Kubernetes service in front of uh, these uh, three pods and then uh, the request will go to uh, one of them. Uh, so there are different uh, load balancing algorithms, but uh, in general, uh, if you don't, by default, it's just going randomly to uh, one of the available pods. So this is a pod to service, uh, kind of a little bit uh, indirect. And then uh, Kubernetes also has uh, an internal uh, DNS service and uh, each pod uh, has a, is part of its environment. It's got uh, the IP addresses of uh, each other service uh, in the cluster. So uh, there's some uh, naming convention and uh, you can discover uh, which other services are uh, in the cluster either through uh, your environment or through the internal DNS service. And containers, uh, uh, they expose uh, specific ports. So uh, the containers, they, if you want to talk to a container or to a, again, to a specific, you talk to a pod, but uh, the pod uh, in the end, when you send a request to a pod, it uh, ends up uh, in one of the containers, which actually uh, do the work. So uh, those containers uh, expose uh, ports and they can support uh, different protocols, uh, TCP, UDP, HTTP, HTTPS, etc. And the, the, the actual uh, networking itself is uh, managed by something called the CNI, the Container Networking Interface, which is uh, an, a network uh, plugin. So there are multiple implementations and uh, each cloud provider has their, their own and then there are multiple uh, open source uh, implementations. So it's a pretty simple interface. And if you implement it, then you can uh, function as a Kubernetes uh, networking layer. And that's uh, there are a lot of uh, kind of innovation and uh, optimization in this space. So uh, people, uh, there is now a eBPF. So there is a Cilium uh, CNI implementation one a company that leads it. So a lot of, uh, a lot of good work uh, happening there. And then there is also a uh, ingress and the egress and then a network gateway API. So for this is from a north south traffic. So this is a traffic coming from outside the, the cluster. So there are a lot of uh, facilities to, uh, to deal with that as well. So that's in a very uh, one slide on a huge topic. And this is uh, what it looks like uh, kind of a uh, one scenario, right? Just one uh, among many, right? So there is a, we have an external load balancer here, port 80, and then uh, it forwards the request to a particular service. So this service uh, has some uh, some DNS name, so the coming from the outside. And then uh, this uh, service is uh, kind of connected to uh, three different uh, pods of the same uh, application, right? So the same with a uh, web app here, we have three pods. Actually, it says end pods here, and then it's the same port. So uh, the service knows uh, which port uh, to uh, delegate the request uh, to. It is a very simple uh, example. All right, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, storage. So uh, Kubernetes uh, needs to be able to work with uh, almost any kind of storage. So it has an abstraction that's called the uh, persistent volumes, PVs uh, for short. And they represent uh, actual physical storage, right? Actual uh, disks uh, somewhere. It could be a local disk, could be a remote disk, could be some uh, storage cluster. And then it has another abstraction that's called the PVC, persistent volume claim. And this is uh, how you abstract uh, the storage and you make it uh, available to, uh, to port. So uh, you define a persistent volume play, uh, claim and then uh, it's a uh, part of the pod manifest. And then uh, this claim it uh, kind of an indirection layer to the actual uh, storage that uh, then now the pod uh, can, can actually use this uh, storage. So uh, 
Storage is managed to similar to what we saw before with the CNI, the container network interface. We have a CSI, container storage interface, which is again, an extensible way for storage provider to work with Kubernetes. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of uh, storage providers and uh, they all want to be on Kubernetes. So uh, they implement uh, this uh, CSI interface. They provide the CSI driver and then uh, as a, if you are an administrator of a Kubernetes, then you can install a specific uh, CSI driver and then uh, provision a storage uh, from this uh, specific storage provider. And then there are also a storage classes that this is another high level abstraction. So as a, as a developer that's uh, defining the storage you need in your pod, you don't want to know all the intricate uh, details of a uh, specific uh, storage providers and the, the, the way to configure them. So again, you, you define a storage class, which is uh, just pretty much selecting, saying something like, I want a persistent disk from a, from a or EBS volume uh, from a AWS, but at the, the high level. And then uh, based on the storage class, which is uh, actually contains all the specific uh, configuration details for the storage device, then uh, this is what's selected for this pod and the pod can use it and uh, be happier and get uh, eff efficient and uh, cost-effective way to, uh, to, to store its data. And then there is a uh, dynamic volume provisioning based on these uh, storage classes. So uh, the, the, this is typical for uh, cloud, uh, cloud providers where uh, there is an API to, uh, to allocate, uh, to provision storage. And it's not that uh, you have a, a fixed amount of a storage, right? So this is kind of the, the old way you have some uh, a cluster of some, uh, some, some disks and then uh, the, the, that's it. If you, need to, uh, if you need more, then you have to go and uh, buy more, configure it into your system. So in the cloud, it's all uh, dynamic and API based. And then there is a, a Kubernetes abstraction. It's called the stateful set. So we talked about uh, workloads that have uh, multiple pods. But uh, these pods, uh, the, the normal uh, deployment, they are kind of uh, stateless. So each one of them is, uh, can be just, uh, if it dies, just uh, you start a new one and uh, that's it. They don't uh, have any uh, persistent state. They may have ephemeral state, right? Local disk that they use for uh, temporary purposes, caching, etc. but uh, they don't uh, consider the, is using persistent storage. If you do have, uh, let's say you have some uh, some uh, data store, uh, Cassandra, something like that, and you have uh, multiple pods, and each one of them uh, has a persistent, right? So we talked about uh, sharding before. So this is a sharding of uh, data, and you want uh, you want if if uh, one of these pods uh, dies, you don't want to uh, to lose the storage. So uh, you want to uh, be able to. Uh, assign a specific uh, identities, persistent identities to uh, the, the member pods of the stateful set. And then when the pod uh, restarts, it can reconnect to uh, the same volume that uh, it had before. And then if it's in case, if it's a local disk, and then the actual uh, node itself uh, got corrupted or uh, crashed, now there is no way to recover it, then uh, a new pod uh, comes up, it's got its own uh, local disk, that now it's empty. And then it's the work of the workload itself, uh, how to replicate data, right? So you need uh, some level of uh, redundancy and then those uh, other pods talk to each other and uh, replicate the data. So, so this, is a, this is not a Kubernetes function, right? So this is something that uh, if you run uh, some uh, data store that uh, uses a uh, local storage, then obviously you don't have a uh, redundancy at this level, right? The, the node, the disk can, uh, can just uh, crash or uh, get corrupted. So you, it's uh, the job of the administrator of this uh, data store to uh, have redundancy at the application that will be able to recover from those uh, errors. So that's uh, storage and stateful sets. So this is uh, just an example of a dynamic uh, volume provisioning. So we define here a storage class. In this case, it's a local disk. And we have the local storage provisioner. So this is the one that the, the storage provider uh, knows about. And then, uh, so this is all done by the cluster admin, right? defining uh, which types of storage you want to expose to uh, users. And then users, they, uh, they, they uh, file kind of, they send the, 
a claim request, right? They create this PVC, persistent volume claim. And this, uh, this uh, PVC, it includes the, the storage class as part of its uh, definition. So then uh, what happens is that uh, the storage class provisioner sees this request and then uh, it provisions the storage uh, dynamically. In this case, it uh, allocates from the local disk of the node that uh, the pod is uh, assigned to, it kind of uh, allocates. This is the part that we mentioned about uh, budgeting and uh, ensuring that the pods have the, the resources they need, right? So if uh, there is not enough room uh, for the PVC that the, the pod requested, again, this pod will, will be pending because uh, we can satisfy its uh, resource needs. But assuming everything is okay, then it will kind of a uh, Kubernetes or the local storage provisioner will curve out a, a certain amount of disk and they allocate it just for this, uh, for this PVC. And then when a pod, uh, when a pod starts later after the, it, uh, it, it mentions, uh, it mounts this uh, PVC to this pod and now this pod can use uh, the amount of disk that was uh, specified. So this is the yeah. dynamic process. Uh, is there a distributed storage provider? Yes, sorry, what's the question? Is that a distributed storage provider? Like I have the local disk and all the nodes I can... So, so lo lo local disk is just, uh, yeah, I took this image from uh, somewhere, but uh, typically more, more common is go it's going to be uh, the cloud provider that they uh, provide. So the dynamic provisioning typically goes to a persistent okay. disk of the cloud provider. That's a problem. Right? Okay, so, so Kubernetes doesn't do a distributed storage system itself. It no, assumes... It it provides just the, the abstractions and the extensibility mechanisms to uh, plug into it. Okay. Yeah, okay. this is kind of a, a common theme that uh, initially it, it did uh, some of it. It had some kind of driver for a specific uh, cloud provider and specific uh, open source ones, but it was a huge uh, maintenance effort. So it was called the entry, uh, entry storage uh, drivers. And then uh, over the last uh, few years, they started to get rid of it uh, more and more. And uh, they defined CSI uh, a while back, but it took some time to, uh, to actually get off all the entry providers. So now Kubernetes is much more uh, lean and mean and uh, kind of provide those uh, interfaces and the uh, specifications and allows uh, pretty much anyone to uh, interface with it. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, security and access control. Uh, obviously, a very important uh, topic uh, for any uh, system that's not uh, a toy system. So K Kubernetes uh, has, again, abstractions here that are pretty uh, common across uh, multiple systems. So that there are users, human users, and there are service accounts. Service accounts is uh, kind of the identities of uh, workloads, applications, uh, CI, CD, things that uh, need to uh, programmatically uh, talk to the cluster and operate in the cluster. And the uh, secrets uh, are mounted into pods. So secrets can be uh, anything. It could be uh, credentials, uh, certificates, uh, passwords, anything you need to, uh, to uh, just to uh, talk to uh, things that uh, require some kind of uh, authentication. So th those are mounted as, uh, as files into, uh, into the pods when the pods are running. And Kubernetes has this uh, four layer uh, security one called 4C. So it's a code, container, cluster, and cloud. And it has uh, the different uh, mechanisms for uh, security at uh, each level. So uh, and th then there is a, uh, is something called the security context for a container. So, but by default, uh, containers can do a lot and uh, they have uh, pretty much uh, the run of the machine that uh, they're uh, running on. They can uh, even uh, operate in a privilege mode, privilege mode and uh, interact with the node that they're, they're running on. And uh, from security point of view, it's uh, pretty much a big no-no. We don't want to uh, just, uh, we want the, uh, you know, the principle of a list privilege and they want to uh, minimize access, need to know bases, et cetera. So, uh, with, uh, so, so this was done uh, mostly for uh, encouraging uh, adoption of Kubernetes. So it's easy, you don't have a lot of limitations, but uh, the security context uh, concept allows you to uh, limit uh, what a specific container can do at a very granular level. So both the uh, Linux uh, capabilities and uh, uh, code armor and uh, a few, uh, 
other things that uh, limit the, what the container is allowed to do. And then at the network level, there, is, uh, there are network uh, policies that again can uh, specify uh, which, uh, which nodes, which pods can uh, communicate, uh, can talk to each other. And then uh, there are other things that uh, on top of Kubernetes, people use a service mesh, which is even more a sophisticated way to uh, control it at uh, even a finer grained level. So this is what I talked about a little bit about the sidecar containers. This is a good uh, use case for that. So uh, can every, I, every, yeah. I, I just wanted to dig in on that security part because I was thinking about it recently, like the, for example, the shared secrets that the container can mount a bunch of shared secrets. But if, if, if someone's able to gain access to the container, they can gain access to the secrets that are shared with that container? Yes. So the within the container, the secrets are mounted as files. If uh, you have a uh, full control of the container, then uh, yes, you can uh, you can see those uh, secrets mm -hmm. and, uh, and use them. Uh, okay. And then the other piece, the sort of the it sounds like Kubernetes offers some sort of additional security wrapping as to what a container can do. Yes. Yes. Um, and is that sort of is that implemented in the container runtime, or or how does that? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so 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 this is. Uh, the, the container runtime can, uh, when it uh, when it launches a new container, then uh, it launches it with uh, specific uh, privileges of uh, what it can do, what it uh, can do, and uh, the security context uh, allows you to uh, configure it uh, per uh, per container. So uh, when you uh, define a, a manifest for a pod, I say in this pod I want to run those uh, containers. The, let's say I have a two containers in this pod, each one of these containers, here's the security context. This is what I want to allow this uh, specific container to do. Okay, so it's like setting a policy that defines the like security settings of the container and the container runtime potentially. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay, but it's not, it's not implementing like an extra layer of, I don't know, protection around it. Like if there's a, if there's a vulnerability in Docker and Docker is the container, then that vulnerability is still likely present yes. okay okay thank you so you uh, you mentioned the container can interact with the node of the pods running so the container is running on the it's not running on the root i hope like docker it's no. uh, so the the, the, the the container is uh running uh so, so container has an an, an image right the, the image is based on some uh on some uh, os and uh, potentially other uh the dependencies and then when the, the container is running it's a uh, it's really it's uh, the, the process the main uh, the, the root uh, process of the container running within the operating system that's uh, defined by its image and this is all uh, isolated so at the, the node level it's uh, isolated by the container runtime right but is it running as a root user so can I, can I, the process in there is a root process uh, so by default, it's running as the root user, but this is part of the security context. You can define it. You can uh, say that they, it's running as a different user. Okay. Because if you say that it access the local file system, so which if I access that in the previous slide of the storage, if I access the file system, what users are going to be accessed by? So, so the, 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 the user of the container, right? So by default, it's going to be the root user. And the, if you specify the different user, it's going to be uh, that user. Right. Yeah, same as Docker. Right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much, it's a Linux, uh, standard Linux security. It gives you an, a way to configure uh, all the standard Linux security capabilities, et cetera. Okay, so, uh, so, so now back to something more uh, kind of a Kubernetes specific. So every request to the API server, it goes through uh, three phases, uh, the authentication, authorization, and admission. So first uh, we need to know uh, who is actually making these requests. Then there is the authorization, which is, uh, this is the next, uh, the RBAC, role-based uh, access control. So this is a pretty coarse uh, grain, right? So let's say I'm, I'm saying, uh, I want to uh, deploy a new pod to the cluster. So uh, I have uh, my identity as a user, and then, uh, but uh, am I allowed even to create a new pod? So if, if I am allowed to create a new pod, then uh, the, the pod uh, will be created. 
And then again, maybe there are some mistakes, right? So I asked for too many uh, CPUs, etc. So the pod is created in uh, etcd, but then the scheduler is now the scheduler is trying to schedule it. And uh, if there is a problem, then it's uh, going to be pending. If everything is okay, it will be scheduled. And then the after, but the, before uh, that happens, uh, after the authorization, even if I'm allowed to uh, create new pods, there is another phase that's called the admission. So admission, it's something. Uh, very custom and uh, very fine grain. So uh, even if I'm allowed to create a pod, maybe I'm not allowed to. So there, there is a console I didn't mention of a namespace. Maybe I'm uh, not allowed to create a pod in a specific namespace. So this is something that the admission control can uh, look at, uh, okay, which namespace is, uh, is Gigi allowed to create pods in? And if I try to create a pod in some kind of a sensitive namespace, then it will uh, reject it. So those are the three phases. And then the, the, the admission part is uh, is optional. So, uh, I mean, the, the, there are some uh, built-in admission uh, controls, but uh, the one I mentioned about the namespace, this is something that uh, as a cluster administrator, whoever manages the cluster, I, I can choose to uh, add those uh, admission checks and the fine-grained ones. So so you could have multi-tenant, basically? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can have a multi-tenancy. So like you can have multi-tenancy namespace. at the namespace level and that uh, other more... Uh, more advanced levels than that even. So you can have a, a, a namespace just for external users and a namespace for internal users. Yes, yes. So, so this is a, a very common to have, a, you have a multiple teams, you don't want them to uh, step on each other's toes. So you, uh, you can say, uh, okay, users of this team, they can only uh, deploy to this namespace and then uh, there are quotas of resources. So you can kind of uh, shard your cluster, what, how many resources are allowed to each namespace. So you can build the multi-tenancy on top of that. But okay. uh, typically, uh, for real system, you build uh, other, other systems. No, you don't use just the namespace. The namespace is, uh, the, the, so this is what I mentioned. There is namespace scope and cluster scope. There are some resources that you need to deploy at the cluster scope. And then obviously the namespace level tenancy, uh, multi-tenancy doesn't help you. Okay, so this is again a very uh, quick sense. And here is, this is the kind of the API request uh, lifecycle. Right? So an API uh, request comes in. And Kubernetes, it's an uh, API, so there is an HTTP uh, handler. And then it does the authentication authorization. Again, if something here is wrong, right, the, the, it doesn't know me, I don't have the right uh, credentials, then it will reject me immediately. If I don't have authorization to perform the request that I'm uh, trying to do, it will reject me as well. If all that works, then uh, yes, yeah, so, so I didn't mention the admission uh, stage. There are two, uh, I, I talked about the validation uh, part. Right, if it's uh, the wrong namespace, then it will reject it. But there is also a, a, a mutating. Uh, so, so let's say uh, I want to uh, always, uh, when a user creates a specific pod, I want to know later uh, who created this pod. So I want to uh, add a label to this pod with the the name of the user. Right. So this is something I can do here at the mutation and uh, mutating admission level. I can just. Uh, so, so I, have, I can define a uh, webhooks and then uh, as part of the admission mutation uh, admission request, it sends a lot of information about the current request. And then the webhook can say, okay, uh, change this uh, request to add uh, this label or I automatically add a security context, right? So I want to, uh, let's say, I don't want people to run as a, uh, or for specific uh, workloads, I don't want the uh, users to run as root. So I can do, try to talk to the all the teams and then please uh, don't run as root when you define pods, but uh, this is, takes a lot of discipline, et cetera. It's not reliable, but instead they can just uh, have a webhook here and then kind of uh, force the issue by uh, just uh, automatically injecting a security context with uh, what I want. So this is uh, so lots of uh, good uh, use cases for uh, mutation. And then the validations, then there is an object schema validation, right? So just to make sure that the mutation part uh, didn't break it. So I didn't create some invalid uh, request now. And then uh, after that, then they were going through the validation phase, which could be more uh, fine grained. And then eventually it gets persisted to etcd. Once it's in etcd, then all the controllers start to look that they, they watch etcd for changes. When the request comes in, then uh, the controllers uh, take over and then uh, do what's necessary. So again, if it's uh, something to create a pod, then the scheduler will take over, try to schedule this pod to uh, an available node. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, deploying application. So Kubernetes, uh, I think I mentioned it uh, briefly before. 
So Kubernetes has a deployment uh, resource for a stateless application that uh, pretty much you can specify uh, the image of uh, that, that you want and then the number of uh, replicas. And that's about it. And then stateful set is very similar, except that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the members of uh, this, uh, this resource, they have kind of the persistent identities. And if uh, one of the pods uh, dies, then uh, the new pod that will come up uh, will try to uh, assume uh, they take its place. And yeah, we define a number of replicas. And then there is uh, something that's called the horizontal pod the auto scaler. So uh, let's say, uh, Typically workloads, applications, they have, uh, depending on the uh, time of day, uh, user demand, et cetera, they have different, uh, <clears throat> different volumes of uh, requests. So uh, it's not always that I need the uh, three ports, right? Because uh, sometimes uh, there is a spike and now I need the uh, five ports and uh, maybe uh, during the weekend, uh, there are, there are, I don't need uh, almost uh, anything. So uh, the horizontal pod autoscaler allows you to define a, a range, right? Let's say a two to eight uh, pods for this particular deployment. And then based on uh, different metrics, uh, by default, the uh, CPU and, map and the memory, but you can also uh, define custom metrics, then uh, it will uh, kind of the deployment will shrink and grow within this range, right? So if the, I see that the, I have uh, currently uh, three pods, but they are all uh, maxed out at the, uh, 100%, 95%, then uh, I'm going to create a, a fourth uh, pod. And then uh, again, if uh, at night or during the weekend, the volume uh, the, the volume is, uh, is not as much, then it will uh, kill some of these pods. And now I'm going to run just with uh, two pods. Uh, what else? Yeah, so dynamic scaling, CPU, custom metrics, deployment manifest. Uh, yeah, so the, when we're deploying applications, uh, often uh, they are uh, templatized. So it's not that we're writing, uh, we're going to look at uh, a manifest uh, soon, but uh, often you want to templatize it. So maybe for different environments, you need the uh, different uh, labels, different regions. So this is uh, very common. And then uh, we have this uh, tool called the Helm, which is a very popular templating and packaging framework. Again, we don't have time to actually look at it, but uh, yeah, so this, so this is an example of uh, actual uh, Kubernetes uh, manifest, so a uh, deployment. Uh, so it's uh, the format is uh, typically YAML, could be JSON or YAML. So again, JSON is a subset of YAML. Uh, most people use uh, YAML because it's uh, less uh, verbose. You can put comments, etc. So let, let's look at this uh, just quickly. So we have uh, things like an API version, right? So this is uh, one of the strong points of Kubernetes. Uh, all the APIs are a version. So you have, uh, this is API group apps, and then the, the version V1. And this is the kind deployment, which we mentioned. And here we have the metadata. Metadata, we have a name, in this case, Nginx deployment. And then we have uh, labels, right? So label here is app Nginx. And this is uh, something that's common for every uh, Kubernetes resource. And then we have the spec. The spec are the things that are specific for this uh, kind, right? For, for the kind deployment, we have a, uh, some fields for other resources will have uh, other fields. So the, the most uh, important one here uh, is the, well, I guess uh, the template is important too. So uh, replicas, how many replicas we want for this uh, deployment. And then there is a selector. Selector is uh, matching the labels of uh, the pod. So, so this is, it looks like a little bit of a redundant here. We have uh, the labels here, we have a uh, match labels here, and then we have uh, more labels here and uh, yeah, that, at this level too. So that I don't want to get into uh, all the edge cases that require it, but uh, in general, uh, we, match, we match things by, by label. So it's not, uh, the deployment doesn't actually know about the specific uh, pods. What it knows about is that uh, it, the, the pods that it cares about has uh, the, this label, app uh, nginx. And then we get to the, te the template is the pod template, right? So we're, we're going to create in this case, uh, three pods. So uh, what is the specification of this pod? So now each, this template is a template for a pod resource. So again, we have the metadata similar to what we have here. And the metadata is just the labels and app engine X. And then this is the spec of, uh, of the pod. So we have here a uh, containers, right? So like I mentioned, we can have more than uh, one or more containers. In this case, we have just one container. So the container name is engine X. And this is really the important thing, right? The image, what is a, uh, what are we running there in this uh, pod? 
So uh, we're running this uh, image that uh, comes from some kind of a uh, image uh, container uh, registry. If uh, in this case, it's going to come from a uh, Docker Hub because there is no prefix. If it's a cloud or private registry, then it will have a more uh, complicated uh, prefix here. And then this is the ports, right? So uh, the ports, uh, so Nginx exposes a uh, port 80 at the container level. So again, there are all kinds of uh, complicated things, how to surface uh, these ports to, to the node level, et cetera. But this is uh, an example of a Kubernetes manifest for a deployment. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, Kubernetes is an extensible platform. I mentioned it a couple of times. So this is a common tweet from one of the Kubernetes developer advocates, Kelsey Hightower. So Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. It's a better place to start, not the end game. So what it means is that Kubernetes is a very powerful and gives you a lot of capabilities, but you don't want your developers, every engineer to just start writing a Kubernetes manifests and uh, deploying them because there is a lot of complexity and there is a lot of things to know. So you want to build uh, some uh, higher level uh, platform on top of it. So this is uh, typically how uh, organizations uh, use Kubernetes. And uh, it could be all kinds of policies, like we mentioned the admission, there are other policies that you can uh, create, but uh, sometimes it's uh, completely abstracting Kubernetes. So where people don't even know that uh, they run Kubernetes, they just uh, build the container and somehow it gets uh, scheduled uh, and running and uh, someone else makes all the decisions of uh, making it secure and uh, scalable, etc. Okay, uh, so uh, what, uh, yeah, so everything is pluggable in Kubernetes, right? So we talked about networking, CNI, storage, the cloud controller manager, so new clouds, uh, like uh, 30 or 40 cloud implementations, uh, support Kubernetes and uh, yeah, Kubernetes developers definitely don't, don't have time to write all those integrations. The access control web books, so I will mention the authentication, authorization, admission, this is all uh, pluggable. You can even have a uh, custom scheduler plugins, right? So uh, Kubernetes has a very sophisticated uh, scheduling algorithm that takes into account uh, tons of stuff, but you may want to uh, write your own uh, scheduler plugin, but more common is to uh, inject yourself into the main scheduler algorithm and just uh, affect it in a, one way or another. So there are different uh, kind of uh, hooks inside the, the Kubernetes scheduler that uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can plug in and uh, add some, uh, some insight to help it uh, configure. Then there are uh, device plugins, right? So a uh, GPU, high performance uh, NICs, uh, FPGAs, all kinds of uh, additional devices can be uh, connected to Kubernetes and uh, managed by it. And then uh, this is a major one that uh, custom resources and operators. So just like we saw this uh, deployment resource and uh, there is a deployment controller that knows uh, what to do with it. When a new deployment is created, the deployment uh, controller will look at the replicas and then uh, create those uh, three pods. So we can define our own uh, resources to manage uh, pretty much anything. So this is a, uh, a big part of a more sophisticated uh, Kubernetes deployment uh, setups. And then the, the operators are the controllers that custom controllers that run, they watch those uh, custom resources. And when a user creates those uh, resources, then uh, the, the operators that you wrote uh, reacts to it. So uh, for, for example, uh, in, a, in a previous uh, company, uh, we had uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, domain names, a lot of uh, custom brands, and uh, we manage uh, something like uh, thousands of different uh, domain names. So uh, initially, we used the uh, Terraform to uh, provision all those uh, domain names, and that was just uh, just a nightmare. So uh, every change you make to a uh, Terraform, it has to uh, <clears throat> to validate all those uh, DNS, and it, it, it means uh, okay, going to a uh, Cloudflare. So it was a uh, super slow. So what we did uh, to uh, instead we created uh, this custom resource for a for a brand name with a different thing with the kind of a nested domains all kind of pretty much all the properties that we wanted to manage we just defined it in this uh, YAML file we called it uh, the just a, a brand and then actually there were a couple of uh, nested uh, 
custom resources. And then we wrote an operator that uh, watches those resources and then talks to a Cloudflare only when uh, necessary. And then uh, our Terraform uh, pains uh, just uh, went, went away. And we had a, yeah, well, we really like this uh, pattern of uh, custom resources and operators. There is this whole concept of a reconcile loop. So uh, there is the desired state, right? This is what you define in your custom resources. There is the actual state of the system. And then your operators, they uh, watch the actual state of the system. They watch changes to the, to the custom resource, to the desired state. And they, whenever they uh, drift apart, then the operator makes, uh, makes, sure, makes sure to uh, return the system to the desired state. This is uh, common in many other domains, uh, robotics, et cetera. It's not uh, unique to Kubernetes, but Kubernetes uh, really takes it, takes it to the next level uh, by uh, allowing uh, users to uh, define their own uh, reconcile loops. And then even the CLI, the Kube Catalyst has a plugin, so you can uh, easily add more uh, more commands and uh, customize the, the output. Everything is uh, really extensible. And uh, yeah, I gave a, a whole talk in uh, 2019 just about extending Kubernetes. Yeah, so maybe I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat if you want to uh, check it out. Yeah, but well, pretty much uh, every slide here can be a whole talk or maybe even a, a whole book. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll just see if you want to watch it later. And yeah, so now, now we've got to uh, ML ops on uh, Kubernetes, right? So uh, why do we want to even uh, run uh, machine learning workloads on uh, Kubernetes? So uh, Kubernetes, uh, many of its capabilities really facilitate the uh, easy scaling. So it's not really, there is nothing, uh, specific for machine learning on Kubernetes itself, but uh, it turns out that uh, machine learning uh, systems, uh, often they, they need a lot of scale and uh, a lot of, uh, they are very dynamic and they need uh, a lot of uh, adjustment of their resources, they're cost sensitive. So uh, you want to uh, efficiently manage the resources to handle the various uh, workloads, you have GPU, CPUs, dedicated storage, and you want to uh, optimize the utilization by uh, allocating and scaling uh, resources needed. And also uh, you want to ensure that uh, you run, uh, when, when you train or you want to influence, you want to run on the GPU, you don't want to uh, accidentally get, get scheduled to uh, run on a regular CPU, unless uh, of course you use the Numenta technology, but uh, in general, uh, you want to, to be able to control and manage things. So, uh, and then the containers can encapsulate the uh, ML models and their dependencies can ensure consistency across the uh, environment. So again, it's a very uh, dynamic, uh, <clears throat> dynamic environment that uh, the developers uh, keep uh, tweaking and modifying. So you want something that they can uh, maintain some uh, semblance of uh, sanity. And it also, it simplifies the deployment portability of uh, machine learning. You, you can play with them uh, locally and then uh, Run them uh, in your production system, so we're using the same uh, the same Kubernetes uh, framework. And then Kubernetes also can orchestrate complex uh, ML uh, workflow with multiple uh, interconnected uh, components. So again, all the networking stuff and ingest ingesting a, a lot of uh, training data, handling a lot of requests for uh, for inference. It can. Uh, it's really suitable for that. And then it streamlines the deployment, scaling management of a distributed ML system. And the, the last thing is that it avoids the vendor locking. So it provides you a lot of options for optimizing costs. You don't have to rely on some uh, vendor. Again, assuming you have the Kubernetes uh, expertise. And then you can still uh, move and migrate between, uh, between uh, different providers. So if, uh, again, my previous company, uh, we migrated from uh, GKE to uh, to AKS, from uh, Google to Azure, because uh, we got a much better deal uh, from uh, Azure. So uh, if, if uh, we were uh, kind of locked into a cloud provider to a Google uh, Google APIs and services, it would probably be a non-starter. But since we're fully on uh, Kubernetes, we were able to uh, make this. Made. It's still uh, it wasn't something as uh, simple. It was a pretty uh, Massive system, but uh, yeah, we are 
managed to do it within a year. So uh, let, yeah, let's look at some uh, popular uh, Kubernetes machine learning frameworks. So uh, there are the, the, <clears throat> the, the standard uh, frameworks that uh, people use, but uh, a lot of them were uh, adopted for uh, Kubernetes or uh, someone wrote a wrapper around them to make them uh, work better in, on uh, Kubernetes. So there are a couple of uh, full-fledged uh, frameworks. There is a Kubeflow, which is a kind of a, it, it's not just TensorFlow, it started as just a running TensorFlow on Kubernetes, but now it's a much bigger system. And then there is a MLflow, there is a Metaflow from uh, Netflix. This one is a uh, Python based. I know that uh, we, Numenta, we, we used to uh, love uh, Python, probably still do. And then there is, so, so Fist is not really a full-fledged. Fist is a more of a feature store, it's a component, but they're trying also to expand, the, expand their scope. And then there are some uh, frameworks that focus more on uh, model serving on inference. So there is a uh, Seldon, Seldon also Seldon Core is open source. Seldon is a kind of more of a service. And then there is a KSERV. So those are uh, good, uh, frameworks to, uh, to look at if you uh, actually try to run something on uh, Kubernetes, not start from scratch. And this is just uh, just some slide I took from uh, Kubeflow, uh, the, the website. So again, I, I don't have a personal experience with uh, Kubeflow. And, uh, I, mean, I worked with the other teams that uh, used it, but uh, I didn't actually manage it myself. I'm always at the, you know, the, the basement there with the Nuts and bolts with all the pipes and the grids of Kubernetes itself managing the, the, the infrastructure itself. So uh, yeah, so you can see there. So during development, you identify a problem, collect analysis data, you choose uh, the ML algo, code your model, experiment, tune. So this is uh, tune the hyperparameters, and you can use uh, so you can use all those uh, standard framework PyTorch, Scikit uh, Learn, TensorFlow. Boost, and then uh, you can uh, experiment again, standard uh, tooling, uh, Jupyter Notebook, fairing pipelines, and then the Katib, another framework for playing. Yeah, I'm sure you know much more about them uh, than me. And, and then, but in, in production, uh, so this is where you do a kind of the, the transform, you train your model. So, again, all kind of the tools for that, and then you serve it and you do the monitoring. And again, this is uh, all the uh, iterating on the, this aspect. So the idea is that it really, it's like an, an umbrella project that uh, gives you uh, patterns and the uh, procedure and documentation and uh, how to uh, connect all those tools and how to run all those uh, activities during development and uh, production. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is uh, the end before the question. So yeah, Kubernetes is a, it's a massive and active uh, open source project with a great community gives you the foundation and tools to run plant scale systems. It's uh, super flexible and extensible, but it is uh, complicated. There is uh, a lot to know and understand. So you need a lot of expertise and effort to build a platform on top of uh, Kubernetes. But uh, if you are really uh, facing this uh, problem, right? you have uh, tens, of, uh, tens or more of uh, servers and uh, you run into all those issues. Okay, how do I make sure that uh, I run, uh, schedule my uh, workloads to the right nodes, and how do I have, it, have enough capacity, and uh, I'm not wasting it. So, uh, if if you're in this uh, situation, then uh, even with all the complexity, it's much better than trying to uh, build it yourself uh, from scratch or use uh, other uh, other systems that are really not suitable for this, this scale and are less uh, powerful. So. Uh, Pretty much, uh, you stand on the shoulders of giants uh, when you are using uh, Kubernetes. All right, that's it. Now we have, uh, can open the floor for questions. So, um, just to uh, clarify, uh, sorry, Luis. Uh, just uh, probably, maybe it's your question too. But just to clarify, um, if um, if the, if the if the basic unit, um, a basic resource is a node in in Kubernetes, um, is there is there a native way to uh, to schedule across GPU like across GPUs across several nodes? So if you have 
you know, eight, eight GPUs per node and your uh, pod manifest requests 12 GPUs, that is unschedulable, right? There's no right. way to abstract that and split it across nodes. All right. So in this case, the pod will remain in a pending state, right? So you, as the engineer that uh, deployed it, uh, you're looking at uh, you're waiting for your pod to uh, to come up, for your deployment to uh, to come up, and then see nothing happens. So then you start to to look at it. You see, okay, the pods were created, but now actually they're in a pending uh, state, um, pending yeah. state. So you you, you look uh, in, again in the pod itself. The, the there is a status bar, right? So we looked at the deployment there. There was the the spec, but uh, at, after you deploy it. Then uh, again, this is something you can do with the uh, different tools. You can look at the status, and then the status will tell you, okay, pending, uh, no node available with uh, 12 cores. And then you know that uh, you made a mistake and you can uh, correct it. Yeah. And you, you don't know of, uh, of any plugins or tools that allow you to, to interact across nodes uh, to schedule on, on GPUs across nodes, right? Yeah. So, uh, what do you mean by scheduling uh, across nodes? So a, a pod is always scheduled to a uh, one node, but you can have multiple pods that are scheduled to a uh, to a uh, multiple nodes. So so there is things that's called the node affinity, right? So let's say you want to, even if there are uh, eight uh, GPUs on this node, you, you have multiple nodes with eight GPUs. You don't want uh, your workloads to run on the same node, right? You want to run on uh, different nodes. So you can uh, you can specify a uh, pod anti affinity. So uh, even if you have uh, three pods for this deployment, they'll never run on the same node. So each one of them will run on a separate node. Yeah. So there are all kinds of uh, yeah, so sophisticated ways to control the scheduling and where things go. But uh, a pod is always running on uh, just uh, one node. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so my question about the tens of nodes, like you said, the, the, the overhead is just the maintenance, or the overhead is an extra overhead if we decide to do five nodes instead of tens, so the, the when uh, we define the replicas for a deployment, it's no. You say to in the decision whether or not to to uh, implement Kubernetes. If you have to make you have tens of nodes, if like the the, the beginning of this, yes, talk, you said like there was there the you should not if you don't have tens of nodes maybe it's not worth it. The question right, is, right. So, so yeah, you, you have a if you have already a, a system, uh, right? You're running a system, and uh, you, you you know what are your pain points, right? So, uh, you need to look at your pain points. So, so maybe for you, even at uh, you have only uh, five nodes, but uh, you do a lot of deployment, a lot of people, or maybe the, the the whole organization is not very disciplined, so you have a lot of uh, problems and outages and the uh, waste. So, maybe you already want to uh, to use Kubernetes. But uh, the, typically, uh, I would say if you have only uh, five nodes, then probably you can uh, <clears throat> get by with uh, you know, just, just uh, scripting, some uh, low-level uh, automation, and you can manage things uh, manually, right? Uh, someone can actually look uh, at, uh, at those uh, five nodes and then make changes if necessary, kind of uh, with uh, scripts and things like that. But uh, once it grows a bit beyond that, then, uh, and especially if it's uh, something more uh, critical, right? So it's uh, running a production, you have uh, customers that uh, depend on you. So you, you can't really wait for uh, people to just uh, notice things and uh, your uh, kind of a homegrown uh, automation, right? Maybe you wrote a couple of scripts that uh, look at metrics and try to, uh, to respond. But then uh, as things get more and more sophisticated, then uh, you, you don't want to, to build this kind of uh, poor man's uh, Kubernetes yourself, right? So when you start to, to get into those more dynamic situations, you need to, to react, you need to make sure that everything is uh, properly configured and you want the uh, policies in place. You have also, if you have a, a lot of uh, engineers, right? You don't want one engineer to bring the whole things down. So you want to have a good uh, per permissions for specific engineers and the multi-tenancy and the segment. So, so those things, uh, yeah, you don't want to build them yourself or you don't want to take uh, some other system and try to customize it uh, this is where uh, Kubernetes really shines. Got it. I have another question. Yeah, please go ahead. Do you know any of the best practices to handle secrets on Kubernetes? Because I've used it some years ago and I remember that the the secrets manifest is encrypted in base 64. So that means that it's not that safe as 
you can go yes. backwards. Yes, that, 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 that's right. So uh, the Kubernetes, if you have uh, permission to read the Kubernetes secret, right, as a, as a user, then uh, yeah, it, it's not encrypted. It's just a uh, base uh, 64 encoded. So uh, what, what, uh, what, what people do for uh, that, that a, couple of, uh, a couple of ways to do it. One is uh, they, they don't use yeah. uh, secrets and they use something like uh, HashiCorp uh, Vault, for example, or if they're running on the cloud, cloud providers uh, systems. But uh, the, the, the more common one, since uh, it's, it's very convenient because those uh, secrets, they are uh, mounted into the pod, then the pod, typically you want those secrets uh, for, for the pod to, uh, to be able to, to use them because uh, the, the pod, right, it needs to uh, access uh, a database. So it needs the username and password for the database uh, that they need to talk to, right? So this is kind of a classic uh, use case for uh, Kubernetes secrets. So it's just as part of your uh, CI CD uh, process, you make sure that, and I mentioned also that there are service accounts, right? So this pod that uh, needs to talk to the database, it has a, a service account. And then you make sure that uh, only this service account can uh, read this uh, secret. So, uh, so at the, on the, on the, at the manifest level, this, the, so uh, the, this, the, the resource is uh, at, on the cluster is uh, not encrypted, but it, can, it is only accessible for uh, whoever has the permissions to access it. On etcd, it is encrypted, right? So the, where the secret is actually uh, stored, it is, uh, it is encrypted. And then uh, on the, on the co container uh, file system itself, it is, uh, it is not encrypted, but, but then it's, uh, so, so this is where you manage the permission who has access to, uh, to, to actually be able to read those secrets. So this is the way uh, you manage it uh, to, to keep it secure. So, so I, I know there was a, so what I mentioned that uh, you may want to, uh, provide some guidance to uh, customers, et cetera. So I can talk a little bit about that uh, if you want. So uh, pretty much uh, what I would uh, recommend for customers is that uh, if you don't have as an organization, you don't have a Kubernetes uh, expertise, then you, you don't want to be kind of the in between. And uh, so you, you can uh, recommend that if they just ask you, uh, we have this, uh, system with uh, lots of uh, workloads and uh, we're running into these issues, then you, you can recommend it, but definitely you don't want to be a kind of their uh, tech support for uh, Kubernetes and uh, provide them uh, architectural guidance, et cetera, because this is something, even if you have the expertise, each organization, they have uh, 